This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Okay. Wish we had one more day. I'm sure you're saying the same thing. <laughs> well, I wish we had one more day of this class, but we don't. <laughs> so maybe a little bit of a rush to try to get to the stuff on medical imaging. That's what I really, uh, I wanted to finish up with that. We'll have to see if we can really do, I, don't, I, I won't be able to do as much of that as I wanted to, so I'm trying to arrange the material that we can do as much of that as I can, because I think it's such a nice application in, uh, of a lot of the ideas that we've seen, certainly in the, in the higher dimensional, two-dimensional case. But to get there, we've got to do a few more uh, foundational results on the higher dimensional Fourier transform. So again, this is under the general heading of getting to know your higher dimensional Fourier transform. And again, the fact is you already know your higher, a lot about your higher dimensional Fourier transform because you know the one dimensional version very well. Today, I want to do two other examples of that, at least two other examples of that, maybe a little bit more. Uh, one where the situation is very much the same, the formula looks very much the same as in the one dimensional case, and one where there's a difference, where you can see traces, certainly, of the one dimensional formula, but um, there are richer phenomena in higher dimensions, already in two dimensions, that show up in the formula and it allows you to make a sort of a new maxim or a new aphorism that uh, explains a little bit that, that has to do with the relationship between the time domain and the frequency domain and reciprocality in higher dimensions. All right? So I want to do a couple of examples of that. The first one, let's say the first formula that I want to talk about uh, looks very similar to the one dimensional case, and that is the so called shift theorem that we have seen and made much use of, shift theorem. So again, I'm going to remind you of the one-dimensional version. A shift in time uh, is uh, reflected by a phase shift in the frequency domain. That's a way of saying it in words. And in formulas, it says that if f of t corresponds to, say, capital F of s, this is the signal in the time domain, this is the Fourier transform, then what happens if you make a shift? If you make a shift by b, then that corresponds to e to the minus 2 pi i s b. That's the phase shift times the Fourier transform of the original function. All right, that's easy result. That was one of the very first results we proved uh, when we were talking about general properties of the Fourier transform. And um, it follows, like many other formulas, just by making a change of variable in the integral that defines it. All right, the integral defines the Fourier transform. Well, what does a situation look like in higher dimensions? Matter of fact, let's look at it in two dimensions because already there you can see what the general pattern is and the argument in higher dimensions is exactly the same. What's a 2D shift? When I say a 2D shift, I mean a function of two variables and what does it mean to shift it? Well, if I have a function of f of x1, x2, then you can shift each variable independently. So x1 can get shifted to x1 minus b1 and x2 can get shifted to x2 minus b2. And so the function f of x1, x2 can get shifted to f of x1 minus b1, comma, x2 minus b2. All right, and the question is what happens to the Fourier transform if you make that shift? Well, we have no recourse other than to the definition. So the definition of the Fourier transform of the shifted function is, and again, I'm just doing it in the two-dimensional case, so I have to write this out in coordinates. Integral from minus infinity to minus infinity, e to the minus 2 pi i, x1 times c1 plus x2 times c2 times f of x1 minus b1 comma x2 minus b2 dx1 dx2. Man, is it tough to do higher dimensional Fourier transforms on the board. All right. Now, there's really only one thing to do here, and that is to make a change of variable. The techniques in a lot of these results are, are making a change of variable in the integral, and that's where some tricky things can come in and some not so tricky things. This is a not so tricky case where it is easy to make a change of variable. It's, what I'm talking about is, is, is making a change of variables in multiple integrals, and that can sometimes present challenges, but not in this case. We can make a change in the variable separately, and the, the result is, and the derivation is exactly analogous, or exactly the same really as the uh, derivation in the one dimensional case. So you make a change of variable, easy change of variable. It is say u1 is equal to x1 minus b1, u2 is equal to x2 minus b2. 
And in this case, the, the area element, dx1, dx2, changes to du1, du2. It's the change in the area element, not in the change in, in dx1 and dx2 separately. That's one of the things that ha that's one of the more comp one of the complications in higher dimensions. But for such a simple case, um, it's just a direct change. So du1, du2 is equal to dx1, dx2. And the integral becomes, the limits of integration stay the same. Again, going from minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity. So it's e to the minus 2 pi i. So x1 becomes u1 plus b1 times c1 plus, to be continued on the next board, plus uh, u2, time, u2 plus b2 c2 f of u1 u2 du1 du2. I wanted to take up as absolutely much space as I possibly could. I bet the cameraman loves me tough. All right. All right, now, this is not hard to, to manipulate. That is, I could write this as integral from minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity. Let's see if I can be a little more compressed about this. E to the minus, uh, what I would do is I'm going to split up the complex exponential, all right? So e to the minus 2 pi i u1 times, uh, or uh, let's see here, let me, let, me, let me put it together here. u1 plus b1, right, okay, so here, let me, let me, let me do this. b1 times c1 plus b2 times c2 times e to the minus 2 pi i um, u1 times c1 plus u2 times c2 times f of u1, u2, du1, du2. If I split it up that way, make sure I got everything right there. To get everything right, I, I, I took all the exponents into account. u1 plus b1 times c1, that's u1 times b1, u1 times c1, b1 times c1, fine. u2 times c2, b2 times c2, fine. And now this part doesn't depend on u1 and u2, so that's a constant for the integral. That comes out. And then what remains is just the Fourier transform. That is, oh, I see there is, I did make a mistake. There's a minus sign there. Oh. Okay. So that's e to the minus b1 c1 plus b2 c2 times the integral double integral minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity. And what remains is just the Fourier, the, the Fourier transform, but the u1 and u2 are replacing x1 and x2. So u1 times c1 plus u2 times c2, f of u1, u2, du1, du2. So what is the answer? The answer is Oh, well, you know, nag, 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 minus 2 pi i. What, 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 2 pi i, what, wow, jeez, gosh, e to the minus 2 pi i. All right, is that all? All right, all right, so what's, so what's left is, what do we get here? e to the minus 2 pi i, c1 times b1, plus c2 times b2 times the Fourier transform of f at c1, c2. All right. Well, all right. Now, there is, after all this work, a much easier way of writing it, or a more compact way of writing it, that shows the shift theorem in higher dimensions to look exactly the same, really, as the shift theorem in one dimension. All right. Once again, here's the phase shift term out in front, but you can see that this exponent here, what's in the exponential, is the inner product of the vector c1, c2 with a vector b1, b2. All right. So if I write b as b1, b2, and of course c, of, as before, is c1 times c2, then f of x1 minus b1, x2 minus b2, is just, I'll get it out of the way in just a second, in vector form, I'd write that as just f of x minus b. And the inner product here is just c dot b. So what does the form, what does the formula look like in vector notation? It's much simpler, and it looks like 
the one-dimensional case. Again, you can make it look as much like the one-dimensional case as possible. So let me write it like this. If f of x corresponds to f of c in vector form, that is, if capital F is the Fourier transform, then the Fourier transform of the shifted function, shifted by a vector, so each variable is getting shifted independently, corresponds to e to the minus 2 pi i c dot b times the Fourier transform at c. Okay? And that formula holds in n dimensions. All right, any number of dimensions. It's pretty, all right? It's the same formula in higher dimensions as it is in one dimension because you're writing things in vector notation. The vector notation allows you a very compact, very easy way of writing it, a very easy way of remembering it, all right? I think it's much easier, I think, it's much easier to remember this than it is to remember this, whether or not you can remember your 2 pi i's, okay? All right, so this is an example I want to go through the derivation just to show you how it worked. The main technique, the only technique <coughs> involved was a change of variable in the multiple integral. All right, I want to go through this example because, so you can see how that worked, and as an example of how something looks very much the same in the one dimension as it does in, or two dimensions as it does in one dimension, or even higher dimensions as it does in one dimension. Now let me look at something that, look at one of the formulas that, um, where some new phenomena come in, and that's the stretch theorem. All right, there's sort of two basic theorems that we've used a lot. One is the shift theorem that I've just derived, and the other is the stretch theorem when the variables are scaled. Okay? The stretch theorem, or scaling theorem, whatever you want to call it, says this. In the one-dimensional case, again, it says that if f of x corresponds to, say, f of s, then if you scale the variable, independent variable, that is f of ax, that corresponds to 1 over absolute value of a, f of s over a. Okay? And again, we've, we've used that many times in many different contexts. And the interesting uh, sort of physical aspect of the theorem, or the, th the thing that comes up often that you have to you know, sort of be aware of in various applications especially, is there's sort of reciprocal nature between stretching in one domain and shrinking in the other domain. All right, that is the reciprocal relationship here between what happens in the time domain scaling by A and the frequency domain scaling by 1 over A. All right, so this sets up this reciprocal relationship between, in, uh, between scaling in the two domains. I don't know if that's a good sentence or not, but you know what I mean. Scaling in the two domains. Two, ah, man, two domains. Okay? Two domains. Long quarter, huh? Two domains. All right. Scaling by A in the time domain means scaling by 1 over A in the frequency domain. And again, the, the proof of this was integration was a uh, change of variable in the integration. That's, there are only really sort of two techniques that ever come up. One is a change of variable, and the other is integration by parts. Those are, the, those are the two techniques that come up all the time. Now, what about in the higher dimensional case? So again, let me look in the two-dimensional case, and I'll state one formula that is directly analogous to the two-dimensional, to the one-dimensional formula, and then I want to do something that's a little bit more general. All right, so let's look at the 2D case. And again, we can scale the variables independently. So we scale, so we have a function of x1 and x2, and we can scale x1 and x2 independently. All right? That is, we can look at f of ax, a1 times x1, a2 times x2. And the question is, what happens to the Fourier transform? All right. I'm not going to go through the derivation. The derivation, is, but I'll give you the result. The derivation is a change of variable, a simple change of variable, because you can change the variables. You can make a change of variable independently. So it's not difficult to change the variables in the multiple integral that computes the, the double integral that computes the Fourier transform of a1 and a2. Here's what you get. We'll recover this result from a more general result, but let me give you this special case first. So it looks like this. Again, if, say, f of x1, x2 transforms to f of c1, c2, 
all right, the, the, the spatial domain and the, and the frequency domain, then f of a1 x1, a2 x2 transforms to 1 over absolute value of a1 times 1 over absolute value of a2 times f of c1 over a1 c2 over a2, just in pretty close correspondence to the one-dimensional case. Okay, if the, if the, if the one-dimensional variables x1 and x2 scale separately, then so do the frequency variables c1 and c2, and it's a reciprocal relationship again. Okay, so again you have reciprocal relationships. All right, and the same thing would hold in higher dimensions if you scale the variables separately. So I'm not going to go through a derivation of that. It's, there, there is a derivation that's given in the notes, but it's really very much the same as the one-dimensional derivation. You have to make a change of variable in the multiple integral, the double integral in the two-dimensional case, multiple integral in the higher dimensional case, but it, but it really goes through very easily. It's a simple change of variable. However, there is a more general notion of scaling in higher dimensions and requires a little bit more complicated derivation and a little bit more complicated looking formula, but it's a very important phenomenon that comes up when you do this. And it's very similar to what we were talking about when we talked about linear systems, all right? The basic result of linear systems, the basic model for linear systems is direct proportionality, that's scaling, all right? But the more general way of looking at linear systems is, in the discrete case, say, is multiplication by a matrix. And likewise, in this case, a more general notion of scaling or stretching is not just stretching x1 and x2 independently, but allowing it to mix up what happens to x1 and x2 by multiplying by a matrix. There's so a more general. And here is where two dimensions and higher dimensions are richer than one dimension. There's more degrees of freedom, more general notion of scaling. All right. Instead of just x1 going to a1, x1, and x2 going to a2 times x2 independently, you could have something like x1 goes into a combination, a times x1 plus b times x2, and x2 goes into another combination, c times x1 plus d times x2. All right? That scales and combines. In other words, or to write that a little bit more compactly, x1, x2 could go to the matrix A, B, C, D times x1, x2. All right, that's AX1 plus BX2, CX1 plus DX2. Okay? All right, so you can just not only scale, but you can combine. So the, so the variables are no longer, the, the, the changed variables are not uncoupled anymore. They're combined. All right? So, in general, again, there are more degrees of freedom in higher dimensions than there are in one dimension. That's the, rich, that's the richness and, in some cases, the complication of the field. But there's not much of a difference between two dimensions and higher dimensions here. All right? So in 2D and up, up, a general scaling is multiplication by a matrix A, say. And I want to assume that A is non-singular, all right? So there's no collapsing here. We'll assume the determinant of A is not zero, all right? So in other words, f of x gets scaled to f of a times x, all right? And the question is, what happens to the Fourier transform? If, if, you, if you do this sort of scaling. Now, there is actually a very attractive formula, and I want to show it to you. And a very attractive and a very important formula. Again, we have no recourse here other than to appeal to the definition of the Fourier transform and to see what we can do. What's more complicated here is, and, and, and the technique is pretty much the same, to make a change of variable in the integral. But the change of variable is a little bit more complicated. All right, so the Fourier transform of f of ax 
I'm going to do this in higher dimensions just for the thrill of it. I'm going to do this in Rn, all right? Even in, not just beyond two dimensions, even, even in n dimensions, because the argument is exactly the same, and the formula looks exactly the same. The Fourier transform of, of f of ax is the integral over all of Rn e to the minus 2 pi i x dot c f of ax dx. All right, Defini by definition, that's just the definition of the Fourier transform of, the, of f, where f scaled by a. OK, now I want to make a change of variable. Change of variable u equals ax. All right, that's fine, but it introduces a number of complications. So the variables are not changing independently here. Everything is sort of, you know, I mean, what I mean is the, they're all coupled, okay? Now, what you have to know, and I'm not gonna, I'm, not, I'm certainly not gonna derive this, and I don't know your um, experience in dealing with changes of variables in multiple integrals, so I'm gonna give you the formula. And if you ever, ever would like to have a quiet conversation about how to change variables in multiple integrals, say over a drink sometime, which is what it takes, I'd be happy to do that, all right? But it looks like this. What happens to the volume element is du becomes the absolute value of the determinant of a times dx. Volume scale, when you make a linear change of coordinates, when you make a linear change of variables, the volume scales by the absolute value of the determinant. All right, so if you think of du as the volume element, du1, du2, up to dun, and dx as the volume element in the x variable, dx1, dx2, and so on and so on, then the volume scales by multiplication by the determinant of a. You've probably, actually, I wouldn't be surprised if you've seen that as a basic geometric fact about linear transformations. What do linear transformations do? They scale the volume by the determinant. It's sort of a geometric, actually, uh, geometric property of the determinant. What is the determinant of the matrix measure? It measures how volume scales. Okay, so that's okay. So that's actually, in some sense, the hardest, well, almost the hardest part. Now there's something else that goes on here. Okay, there's something else. So the other thing that happens is, is in the exponential there. All right, so if I want to make a change of variables, what happens to the exponential? What about the complex exponential? All right, so I have x dot c. That's the thing that I'm worried about there. What happens to x dot c? To x dot c. Well, again, I'm assuming the matrix is, is non-singular. The determinant of a is different from zero. So if u is equal to ax, then x is equal to a inverse u. I want to express everything in terms of u. All right, everything in the variable has to be expressed in terms of the, ch the variable that I've changed to, which is u. So if u is equal to ax, then x is equal to a inverse u. That's fine. Then I have to look at x dot c is equal to a inverse u dot c. All right, now, something more actually can be done with this. All right, there is a general relationship, and this is very important. There's a general relationship between matrix multiplication and dot products. Okay. There's a general relationship between matrix multiplication and inner products. And it says this. Let me just give you the general statement. It says just for a general matrix B, say. We will apply it to this particular case, but there's a general relationship that's going on here. So it says that if I have a matrix B, then B of X dot Y is the same thing as X dot B transpose of Y. All right? You can shift the matrix from one variable to the other, and in, do, in so doing, the transpose comes in. All right, now, let me, let me just, so for example, EG, C, EE 263. I know this is an EE263 because I've taught EE263, and I know I did that formula when I did it. So let me just ask, who has seen this formula? That's okay. Who has not seen the formula? Well, it's a pleasure to bring this formula to you. <laughs> All right? It's a very general formula. It comes up in a variety of contexts, and we're going to use it exactly here. All right? If it, again, if it puzzles you, we'll have a drink sometime. We'll talk about matrices. We'll talk about complex exponentials. What fun. 
all right? Change of variables, all that stuff. A couple of drinks in me, you won't believe what I can talk about. All right, so now let's apply it in this particular case, all right? So for us, x star a inverse u dot c then is the same thing as u dot a inverse transpose times c, all right? Now, it's very common to use a special notation here, all right? I'm going to write a inverse transpose. I mean, that's an ugly thing. Write a inverse transpose as a to the minus t, all right? That's a common notation. Indicates inverse transpose. So I write the formula a little bit more quickly or more compactly as um, that's just the convention. It says a inverse u, a inverse u dot c is a inverse transpose of, is u dot a inverse transpose of c. OK, so that's the last little piece that we need. Now I want to plug this into the formula for the Fourier transform. Okay, plug all this into the formula for the Fourier transform. Okay. So where are we? We are. It's an integral still over all space because you're making a change of variable by a non-singular matrix. Space goes to space and not a lower dimensional space. So let's see, e to the minus, so we're making a change of variable here, all right, in this integral, all right? And everything should be written in terms of u. So it's an integral over all of Rn. e to the minus 2 pi i x dot c becomes e to the minus 2 pi i um, u dot a inverse transpose of c, all right? f of ax becomes f of u. That was the whole point of, of making the change of variable. All right, that becomes f of u, all right? And dx, the volume element in the x-coordinates, becomes 1 over the determinant of a, absolute value determinant a times the volume element in the u-coordinates, du. 1 over determinant of a, du. All right. Now, the determinant of a is just a constant. That comes out of the integral, 1 over the determinant of a. This is 1 over determinant of a times the integral over rn e to the minus 2 pi i u dot a inverse transpose of c applied to c f of u du. And now you see that integral is nothing but the Fourier transform of f evaluated at this variable. All right? Not evaluated at xi, but evaluated at a inverse transpose of xi. All right? So this is 1 over the determinant of a times the Fourier transform of f evaluated at a inverse transpose of xi. That is the formula. What is the formula? Let me summarize it for you. So the general n-dimensional stretch theorem, it's very attractive, really, if you like this sort of thing. So here's the stretch theorem. All right, in any dimension, and in particular, it actually also holds in one dimension. So if f of x corresponds to, say, capital F of C, all right, so this is the spatial, this is the function, this is its Fourier transform, then f of ax, I want to write it so it looks like the, like the one dimensional case as much as possible, corresponds to 1 over the Fourier transform of this is determinant of a times the Fourier transform of f evaluated at a inverse transpose at C. A inverse transpose at C. That's the formula. 
All right, that looks a little different, right, than the classical stretch theorem. But it includes the, it includes the one-dimensional stretch theorem. It also includes the theorem that I, that I had first. I'm going to say a couple things about this, all right? Because that's a different kind of, that's a different looking formula than what you might have been expecting or what, you, or what we've had before. All right, but that's what the math tells you, all right? That's what happens. You change your variable, you, change, you scale according to, multi, according to a matrix, multiplying by a matrix. That's how the Fourier transform changes. Deal with it. All right? All right, so now there's particular cases. That is, the, the, the scaling x1 scales by to a1, x1, x2 scales to a2, x2 can be written as this matrix times x1, x2. This scaling is given by this matrix times x1, x2. a1 times x1, 0, plus 0, 0 times x1 plus a2 times x2. All right? So, and of course, so this is a. Then the determinant of a, absolute value of the determinant of a is absolute value of a1 times absolute value of a2. All right? What is a inverse, well, for a diagonal matrix, A inverse, and I have to assume that A1 and A2 are different from 0 here. I'm assuming the determinant is different from 0. So for a diagonal matrix, A inverse is equal to 1 over A1, 1 over A2, 0, 0. And it's diagonal again, so it's transpose is equal to itself. A inverse transpose is equal to the same thing, 1 over A1. 0, 0, 1 over A2. And if you unpack all this, you will find that applying the general stretch theorem in this special case leads exactly to the theorem as I'd stated it before. Okay, so that's good. All right. Now, there's another important special case. So that's good. We haven't lost anything, certainly, and we've gained something. But we, in particular, we've included the formula that I had before. Another special case, let's do it to, just do it in two dimensions, is when coordinates are rotated. That is a two-dimensional rotation matrix, 2D rotation. That is A equals, it's usually written this way, cosine of theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. All right? That is a rotation through an angle theta clockwise, I think. All right? But I'm always, I, get always, I always, always have to think about that for a couple of minutes, but I don't have a couple of minutes. All right? That's a rotation by an angle theta. Angle theta. Now, this matrix has a special property. This matrix is orthogonal in the following sense. It's a rigid motion. It just rotates. To say it's orthogonal is to say that A transpose times A, same as AA transpose, is the 2 by 2 identity matrix. Okay? So there are a couple of consequences of that. One consequence is the determinant is absolute value 1 because the determinant of A transpose A on the one hand is equal to the determinant of the identity, which is 1. On the other hand, the determinant of A transpose A is the determinant of A transpose times the determinant of A. The determinant of A transpose is the same as the determinant of A, so this is the determinant of A squared, so the determinant of A squared is 1, so the absolute value of the determinant of A is 1. The geometric meaning of that is that A preserves volumes. And it does. It's just a rotation. It's a rigid motion, so it is not distorting volumes. Volumes are distorted under linear transformation by the absolute value of the determinant, but in this case the absolute value of the determinant is 1. The further consequence is since A transpose times A is equal to the identity, 
That says that A transpose is the same thing as A inverse, because the inverse of a matrix is, and you take the matrix times its inverse, you get the identity. So that identifies A transpose as A inverse, or the other way of putting that is A inverse transpose is equal to A. That is A inverse transpose is equal to A. Okay? All right. Plug that into the formula. In the case of the rotation matrix, in the case of a matrix like this, plug this into this general formula. Okay, plug into formula. If you plug into the formula, f of ax goes to 1 over the determinant of a times the Fourier transform at A inverse transpose at C. All right, determinant of A is 1, A inverse transpose is A. So this is uh, the Fourier transform of A applied to C. That is, F of AX goes to the Fourier transform evaluated at AX. goes to the Fourier transform at A -X, A -X -C. All right. In words, a rotation of the spatial domain corresponds to the same rotation of the frequency domain. All right. If AX is a rotation, then A -X -C is also a rotation, but they're in different domains. This is a rotation of the spatial, spatial coordinate. This is a rotation of the frequency coordinate. So this says rotation of the spatial domain corresponds to uh, the same rotation same rotation of the frequency domain all right let me put this another way all right think of the function think, think of this in two that, think of we're working on two variables here all right so, although you have the same formula in higher dimensions, but, but, but um, just think about two, two variables. Then the function f of, a, f of x is an image, all right? f of ax is a rotated image. You take an image and you take its spectrum, all right? And then you rotate that image and take the image of the rotated spectrum. What do you think is going to happen? Look at that. It's not going to change. It's just going to rotate the spectrum, all right? That's the physical interpretation of this. If you rotate an image, that's the same thing as rotating its spectrum. Okay, you take the image, you take its spectrum, you rotate the image, you rotate the spectrum by the same amount. All right, so this is an important result in imaging. All right, it tells you that the spectrum somehow is unchanged or not, un I mean, it's, it's, the spectrum is rotated along with the image, along with the original image. Okay, very nice, very consistent. Finally, there's a new aphorism that goes with this theorem. It's also very important, and this is something new. All right, this is something you probably have not said to yourself as you've been drifting off to sleep at night. Much as I'm sure you've been saying other things about this class as you've been drifting off to sleep at night. Once again, if f of x corresponds to f of c, then f of ax corresponds to... I mean, I'm just writing down the theorem again. f of ax corresponds to 1 over the determinant of A times F of A inverse transpose C. All right, now, if you believe that scaling in one domain has to do with, that there's a reciprocal relationship between scaling in one domain and scaling in the other domain. All right, if you believe that from the one-dimensional case, and if you want to maintain that intuition, all right, that there's a reciprocal relationship between the two domains, then what you have to say is that in higher dimensions, reciprocal relationship means A inverse transpose. All right, that's something new that you have to say to yourself. That's a new interpretation of the word reciprocal. All right, you buy the premise, you buy the gag, as they say in showbiz. And if you believe in this formula, well, you have to believe in the formula because I just arrived at it. And if you, but if you believe, that there ought to be a reciprocal relationship between scaling in one domain and scaling in the other domain, then what you have to say to yourself is, in higher dimensions, as tough as it is for me, I have to believe 
that reciprocal means somehow means inverse transpose. And you're not seeing that relationship in one dimension because in one dimension you, only, you don't have en enough degrees of freedom. You only see this relationship in higher dimensions because you have more degrees of freedom. It's more complicated. Things are coming, extra things are coming in. So in higher dimensions, dimensions, reciprocal, should, uh, maybe I shouldn't say means uh, inverse transpose, but I should say should be understood in terms of inverse transpose. All right, should be interpreted, should be understood, understood as inverse transpose somehow. All right, that's the, that's the philosophical consequence of this higher dimensional stretch theorem. And it's something new, all right? This is something you haven't seen before. This is something you didn't see in one dimension. You didn't have to say these words in one dimension. You didn't have to say the words inverse transpose in one dimension, but you have to say them in higher dimensions, all right? And, you, and this, is a, this has to become a new part of your intuition, or at least a new part of your sort of mathematical lexicon and, and the way you apply things. You have to say to yourself, okay, there's scaling here, you know. That means somehow I should expect to see inverse transposes coming in. And not today, but next time, actually we'll see a, a, an absolute, a perfect physical manifestation of this, all right? That is, this is, I'm not just making this up, but, when, and, we'll, and please read ahead a little bit and, please, and read around in the chapter, because next time I want to talk about, I'm not done today, <laughs> but next time I want to talk about, um, higher dimensional Shaw functions, lattices, and crystallography. And exactly this reciprocal relationship of inverse transpose is, is what comes in there. And it comes in there in an extremely important physical context. All right. And as it turns out, I'm told that that same relationship you see there, and I, I don't know this for a fact, I don't understand how, I haven't, haven't learned it. Uh, the same sort of relationship of, the same sort of relationship that we're going to see next time between lattices and so-called reciprocal lattices also, it turns out to be important in video signal processing, I'm told. I'm told, or in general digital, digital image processing, that I sort of believe, but, but evidently this comes up a lot in, uh, in particular video processing. Okay. Now, let me just say a few, in a couple of minutes today, let me say a few just kind words about delta functions. This is one of the things, good news, first of all, we don't have to deal with rapidly decreasing functions, Schwartz functions, distributions, or any of that stuff. That all carries over, all right? So I don't really either feel the need, and you don't have to be afraid, of a whole secondary treatment of rapidly decreasing functions in the theory of distributions. So we're going to use these things pretty much as before. And delta functions also go through as before. Okay, delta functions, deltas at all. So again, delta is defined the same way. You can think of this in terms of distributions. A delta operates on a test function. You can write it out in terms of an integral if you wish. But the, defi the basic definition of the basic properties of delta functions are as before, as in 1D. So for example, delta paired with phi, delta, a two-dimensional or a higher-dimensional delta function paired with phi is phi of zero. Here, all right, so phi is a function of n variables, and zero is just the, the origin, all right? So delta operating on phi just pulled out the value of the origin. And I can look at a shifted delta function. I can write it as delta x minus b, or I can write it as delta sub b if I want. So b is a vector here, so it's shifted to another point in Rn. And the basic relationship is the same as in one dimension. That is delta sub b paired with a function phi is phi evaluated at b. OK? The, the n tuple, b1 through bn. So b, b here is b1 up through bn. OK? Same as before. And it's also true, good news, that the Fourier transform behaves the same way. You have the same formulas for the Fourier transform. That is to say, the Fourier transform of the delta function is 1, the constant function 1. 
And the Fourier transform of the shifted delta function, delta sub b, is e to the minus 2 pi i b dot c. All right, so again, it looks, if you use the vector notation, it looks the same as the one-dimensional case. Okay, it's a complex exponential. That's all great. And again, it's also true that if I multiply delta time, I should have mentioned this before, sorry. If I, multi if I multiply delta times a function, it just samples the function. Multiplication, I should have mentioned this when I was talking about the basic pairing here, is if I take uh, a function f times delta, that's f of 0 times delta. And if I take f of 0, f of, this is a vector function now, a function of n variables. And likewise, if I take f of delta sub b, that's the same thing as f of b times delta sub b. Same results as before. Okay, everything is the same. All right, now, where are things different? Well, again, when you start to bring matrices in, actually, things become a little bit different. When you start to talk about scaling, and I think this will be the last thing I say today. I probably won't derive it. I'm going to use it more next time. Okay. But let me mention now the scaling properties. Scaling. The scaling properties of delta. So here I actually have to write the, write the formula, um, write it in terms of a variable. The basic phenomenon is, well, again, what's, what was the one-dimensional case? The one-dimensional case was if I take delta and scale it, then delta ax is 1 over absolute value of a times delta of x. So I allow myself to write the variable delta of x instead of thinking of it as a distribution. Okay, that's a result we used in various contexts. All right, the tricky thing here is that there's no scaling in the inside here, all right? It's not the, sh it's not the shift, it's not the stretch formula for the Fourier transform. It's, just, it's an independent fact about how delta scales, okay? And what do you suppose the result is? I'll leave that up there. What do you suppose the result is in higher dimensions? If I scale delta, if I scale the variable inside by a, there are ways of making this precise without bringing the variable in, but I'm not going to do that. It takes a little bit more, it will take more effort. Um, so if a is a matrix here, then this is 1 over the determinant of a. It's really, really analogous to the, uh, the one-dimensional case, uh, times delta of x. Okay. That's how delta scales. We're going to need this result. I'm not going to, the, the, the derivation is actually given in the notes, but I'm not going to derive it. We are going to use it, however. And we're going to use it. I think I won't, I won't try to push ahead today. We're going to use this next time when we talk about higher dimensional Shaw functions. That's where this sort of lattices, reciprocal lattices, actually higher dimensional sampling theory all comes in. And we won't have, we'll only have a chance to do a little bit of it. So we'll see this in connection with higher dimensional Shaw's. It's really cool. All right, so read through that material if you would. You don't have to read through the sampling part of it because we're, I don't think we're gonna have a chance to do that, although it's my favorite stuff. Um, but I do wanna talk about the crystallography, the application of the Shaw stuff to crystallography because that's where you see this wonderful uh, fact about reciprocal means inverse transpose come in in a very important setting, all right? So we'll do that next time, and I hope actually to push forward a little bit and start talking about medical imaging. All right, see ya then.